Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, my great pleasure to introduce Professor Pam Vector Litvak from University of Columbia, the Department of Epidemiology, the Malman School of Public Health. Uh, Professor Pam is working with us these three days. Um, we have an agreement under the Global Columbia Global Health, so I've uh, been working for the last 18 months. And she's going to give a seminar today on folates in our diet in our home, exposure and adverse outcomes in childhood. I'll just ask, uh, before she starts, she, she's going to um, uh, give a brief uh, explanation about her uh, CV, her interests, and then goes for the seminar. I hope you enjoy and ask a lot of questions at the end. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for inviting me here. And I'm actually here in Rio on my way to Sao Paulo for the um, Environmental Epidemiology Large Conference. It's a large international conference, so I was really glad I had the opportunity to stop in Rio and work here because usually um, Gilberto has been coming to Colombia with students. So this way I, I'm here and I'm very impressed with what I see. I've been very impressed with the presentations from the students um, the last few days. I um, So just a little bit about my interests. So my interest is really is in a lot of different kinds of exposure during the prenatal period and during early childhood and outcomes throughout the life course. In particular, much of my work has been with environmental contaminants. I started my career doing a lot of work on prenatal exposure to environmental lead. I've since moved on and I've gone through some other metals like um, mercury and arsenic and manganese, which we still work on but my group is now working predominantly on a class of chemicals called endocrine disruptors. And that simply means that these chemicals may resemble hormones like estrogen or testosterone, other um, androgens or thyroid hormone and go on and compete with those chemicals for binding sites and compete with the function of those chemicals. But today I'm going to talk a little bit about, I would try to make it sort of nutrition related and um, so I'm going to talk about a class of chemicals today called phthalates, which are actually found in foods because they're found in food packaging, predominantly, as I'll show you. And I'm going to talk about work that we've done at our Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health on um, phthalate concentrations in the um, mother during the last trimester of her pregnancy and adverse uh, outcomes in children, actually, we have data now up to 11 years of age. So um, first I'm going to give you a little bit of background. And this is, oh dear. Okay, so anyway, I can, I can say it. So th I, if I knew the, maybe the light, if we can get the light, that might help. No? So that makes it a little bit better. Okay. So phthalates are high production chemicals that have very similar structures. As you could see here, I put up the structures of five commonly used phthalates, DEP, DNBP, DIVP, B, BZP, and DEHP. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them as we go along. In the US, it's estimated that there's about 470 million pounds are produced or imported each year and they're widely used, as I'll show you, in commercial products. So exposure is ubiquitous, and I could take anybody in the US or anybody probably sitting in this room and measure concentrations of the metabolites of these compounds in your urine. That's how they're measured. Um, so these are just some of the sources of phthalates that we find, and this is how they get into food. They're in plastic containers, so microwaving in plastic containers, leaches out the phthalates, puts them into the food. Um, I now personally have switched. I, my children told me I couldn't be hypocrites anymore, so I went out and I replaced everything with glass. <laughs> um, yeah, the salmon in the upper right corner is packaged in plastic, also containing phthalates. The microwave food in the lower uh, right corner over there, and the lining in the can of corn here, 
all of this contains phthalates, so they're ubiquitous, and they're actually very useful chemicals because they actually are pliable, so they're used in tubing for medical um, uses, they're used in, um, in food packaging, they're used in toys, although m many of them have been banned in toys. They're used in um, many other consumer products. They also have a very unique property that they sort of hold scents. They, make, they hold the perfume in many products, so they're also ubiquitous in personal care products, as I'll show you. So this is just a slide. It's a very busy slide, but it's taken from a paper that was published in 2013, and it, it just really describes the methods that that paper used to try and estimate phthalate concentrations in foods. So what the investigators did in upstate New York was go shopping. And they bought um, beverages, they bought 13 different kinds packaged in a variety of different ways, they bought meats, they bought 13 different kinds of meats, and packaged also in a variety of different ways, in plastic, in paper, in uh, trays covered with plastic wrap, and so they were measured, then they were going to measure the phthalates in these food products. And what did they find? So you can't see this very well, but, oh, and here's a pointer, so this may help actually. Okay, so what they found in, so this is the top row of each sort of um, block in the table, is what this particular study found, and it's comparing it to some other studies that have also looked at the concentrations of phthalates in food. They measured the concentrations of four different phthalates in this study. They found that it widely varied by food type, okay, and that it widely varied by phthalate type. And so what really this, this study demonstrated that while you may have a limit on, let's say, DEHP, if you add up the concentrations of phthalates from all of these different foods, the limit in any one food source is not indicative of what you're exposed to. And exposure is very important, particularly, as I'll show you, for pregnant women. So um, really, we could say, and I'm sure it's the case here in Brazil as well, that many of the packages of foods contain a lot of phthalates. And, and you're exposed from the phthalates. In terms of personal care products, this is just some pictures of products that phthalates are found in. So they're commonly used in shampoos, deodorants, powders, uh, detergents, laundry detergents, as well as uh, detergents that you might wash dishes in or clothing in, and in particular in nail polish. And I'll just um, show you that the, this is um, the headlines from the New York Times just a few months ago on May 8th. There was a big story, I don't know if it got press here in Brazil, but the New York Times did a study in nail salons where women go, go and get their nails done and found that the workers in nail salons were exposed to extraordinarily high concentrations of these chemicals um, because they're in many of the nail products. This was a huge story in the New York Times in the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. I'm now consulting with them on this issue. Um, but the headline reads, Perfect Nails Poisoned Workers. And this was the first time the New York Times actually ran the story in many different languages on their website because many of the workers in these nail salons are, don't understand English. So this was a very important study, really bringing, important piece of journalism, I should say, not study, uh, really bringing to the forefront the use of products without proper protective gear. So what's the good news and what's the bad news? Once a lot of the um, work on phthalates has started to be published, and it's been published from many different places in the world, the use of some of these phthalates in these products dramatically decreased. So you could see, for example, DEP is decreased by 42% in fragrance, cosmetics, and medication. Um, BBZP, which is associated with asthma in children, I won't be speaking about that today, has gone down from, from these uh, plastic floor tiles and food packaging. However, there's been a dramatic increase in what we're now calling the replacement compounds 
these replacement phthalates, which haven't been studied as much as these phthalates. And so now we're starting to study some of these compounds to see if replacing one thing with another is just replacing bad with bad. So I tried to find the situation in Brazil. Um, and this was just doing a quick Google search. And I did find that Brazil uh, was restricting toy imports made with phthalates from China because many of these toys are made in China. Although I would imagine that those are the more the phthalates that I showed you in the previous slide that are decreasing in use. So they're restricting those toys. And now that Brazil is actually mandating labeling on medical devices, the tubing, the flexible tubing that you use when you draw blood, it's labeling. It's not it's not banning that are um, they're requiring. Those that's what I found. Okay, so at least I think the government is aware of it and probably starting to do something about it. So what do we do when we do choose to do exposure assessment? So now I, I hope I've shown you that these these products are in food, they're in care packages. Do they actually? So who's exposed? How does it occur? So is it dermal? Is it inhalation? Is it ingestion? How much exposure occurs? How often does it occur? And more importantly, which I didn't put on this slide, is what are the effects of the exposure? So diet is, uh, if you look at one particular phthalate, DEHP, diet is the predominant route of exposure. So it's really in the packaging materials. Um, many of the other phthalates, inhalation or dermal exposure, so exposure through the skin or through the air, once exposed, these compounds, and these are the ones that I'll be talking about today, are rapidly metabolized, and so they don't exist in this form. They actually exist as their metabolites, and they're rapidly excreted in urine. So one problem you have when studying these compounds in large populations is that the exposure measured at any point in time only really reflects exposure in the last 24 to 48 hours. So the large assumption you need to make is that people don't change their use their, their habits in terms of use of products very rapidly. So that the one point exposure metric is going to reflect exposure. I can tell you they're expensive to measure, so you really only want to measure them one point in time because they cost the, the, the whole panel to measure and we do our, our measurements at the Centers for Disease Control the panel is about $200 per sample. So if you're studying thousands of children, it gets into a lot of money very quickly. Um, so here again, I'm, I'm this slide is sort of repetitious. What it's showing is demonstrating the DEHP concentrations in food and actually the parent compound is measured in the food and not the metabolite. And another study, um, this is, this is a very interesting study from an intervention study. So what they did here was they took 20 families who used products containing phthalates, had them do their normal routine for a period of time, and then asked them to only use phthalate-free products, which they provided, and, and food that was packaged fresh and not in plastics or in cans, for the same period of time and found a dramatic reduction in markers of exposure demonstrating that yes, these things are responsible for exposure. And if you take away these products, you can get this reduction in exposure. But this was a small study, it was only 20 families. And probably families that were highly motivated, they weren't selected in a random fashion. So this is just data from a study in 2006 that looks at the personal care products and looked at, measured a variety of different phthalates in them. And again, you c and I just show this to show the wide variation of phthalate concentrations in each specific product, okay? And especially if you note the purple is rather high in all, that's DEP, and the yellow is high, uh, DBP, okay? So that these products, again, are uh, widely used. And I, I have a study which I'm not showing data from today because we're just starting the analysis. 
but in Israel where we recruited um, 300 families at the time of delivery, measured, um, asked them a lot of questions about phthalate product use, have the urine to measure the phthalates, so that hasn't been done yet, and looked at one particular outcome among many was looking at anogenital distance in the infants. And that's exactly what it means. It means the distance in boys from the midpoint of the anus to the, to the top of the penis, and then from the midpoint of the anus to the other side of the penis, and penile width. And it's thought to be a measure of exposure to sex steroid hormones, in particular testosterone, during pregnancy. We found that just a simple count of the products that the mothers used during pregnancy was associated with decreases in penile width, which is exactly, um, which is a similar finding to others that have looked at exposure to phthalates and measured these dimensions in children who are a bit older, between age two and four. And they actually had the metabolite measure, saying that we may be able to not do some of the expensive assays and just count the products, right? Um, so this study actually comes from a study that looked at the standard deviation of phthalates and we we'll won't look at the parabens here, but the phthalates are sort of the first part of these graphs in these personal care products. And again, it really depends on how you use the product. So these are products that you rinse off, like uh, body wash. These are products that you leave on, like skin lotion, skin cream. And these are baby care products. So this is you know, one of the most um, interesting findings. These are concentrations on a log scale. If you notice, the scale goes from 0.01 to 0.11, all the way up to um, 10,000 over here. And you could see that there's quite an exposure from baby products as well. That would be the powders and the lotions. And again, so this is now moving towards the biomarker of exposure, so the urinary concentrations of the metabolites of these products. And what this study um, did, it's not my study, it's somebody else's study, they looked at exposure doses that were measured by the sum of the inhalation, uh, oral and dermal ones, as well as um, estimated in the lighter brown bars from biomonitoring study. And then they looked at the uptake of products here. And again, you could see that there's extraordinarily high exposure in infants and in toddlers by food. The, gr the light green bars here represent exposure from food. So these are, are really um, infant formula that's packaged in plastic or baby bottles that are plastic or have the plastic inserts. Or, or some baby food, but it's present in the infants for DEHP in particular, for in the toddlers as well as in the female adults, the women of childbearing age. This is shows um, from a similar study but in a, a cohort study called the HOME study that's done in Cincinnati, similar concentrations by age of the child from one to five and concentrations of these phthalates and you could see that they don't vary very much by age. And some of these are repeat measures in the same children, but some are not. Um, but you can see that once exposed, it looks like the exposure persists across the age groups, really demonstrating that the product use isn't changing that much, that they're still getting exposed from food packaging, from toys, from other kinds of consumer products. And um, I'm just going to show you a few more of these before I get to sort of my own work. Um, that this is in a group of pregnant women, and these are from these results are from three, four distinct cohort studies. Um, so they're from the um, INMA study. Oh, I'm sorry, they're from a study done first in uh, Spain, and one study in Spain, another study in Spain, and then a study in Denmark. And then the NHANE study, which is a random sample of the U.S. population, or is based on a random sample of the U.S. population. And this is looking at concentrations in um, women who are pregnant, okay? And you can see here that the concentrations also vary by the type of phthalate. 
And this one here is BPA. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, everybody was looking for BPA-free water bottles, right? So this is BPA. But these are, the rest of them are phthalates. You could see that there is still demonstrable exposure among pregnant women in this study. And in fact, in these studies that looked at the infants of these children, there's still quite an exposure concentration in the infants as well. And this mimics the concentrations in the mother, telling us that sort of families may have the same sort of pattern of exposures because due to the same use of the same products in the home. And um, I think this might be the last one. This is just looking at a similar study in California um, done by um, some of my colleagues in California that looks the darker bars are the mothers and the lighter bars are the infants. And it looks at the concentrations of various phthalate metabolites um, in in the adults and in the children, and again, demonstrating similar patterns of exposure. And finally, this, um, I wasn't the first one to count the products, but this is just looking at the relationship between products and a concentration of one particular, of three phthalates added up together. And um, my colleague, this is, was done at the University of Washington in Seattle, also found this association between the number of products used and the urinary concentrations of the metabolites. So really, why, why did I tell you all of this about exposure and show you exposure in food and products? Because there's a lot of purported health effects of phthalate exposures. People have looked at effects on child cognition, child behavior, thyroid dysfunction, asthma, and respiratory symptoms. And each of these have found associations, although some of them um, are still contradictory among studies. And more importantly, it's not known whether the effects associated with early exposures during the fetal period are persistent into later childhood and perhaps later into adulthood and in even into the next generation. So this is just looking at some prior research, um, research before the study I'm presenting, on phthalates and child mental and motor development. And there was a study in Korea. There's, been a, there's another study in US minority uh, children and a study in Mexico. And they studied a variety of different phthalates, actually they're metabolites, but I put the parent compound on the slide, and found um, associations um, that sometimes contradict each other. So some studies find inverse associations with child cognition in boys, others find it in girls only. Some studies find associations of motor function in boys, some find it in both boys and girls, and some find that these phthalates in particular might be protective of motor dysfunction in boys. So there's still some controversy amongst the findings of these studies. So our study in the children's, um, in the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health is really a birth cohort of 328 African American and Dominican mothers and children who live in northern Manhattan in the Bronx. I'll show you a map. They were enrolled between 1998 and 2006, actually part of a larger study of about 706 children. Um, and the the criteria for mothers to participate in was that they couldn't be active smoking. They had to be non-smokers. They couldn't use um, street drugs. They couldn't be HIV positive or have pre-existing hypertension or diabetes. So they were relatively healthy, but they were almost uniformly of lower social status. And during the prenatal period, they had a questionnaire we abstracted their, I'm sorry, we, abstract, we abstracted their medical records and we measured phthalates in the third trimester urine. Um, in postnatally, the children were followed at age three, five, seven, and now 11. And we had questionnaires and we measured phthalates in child urine, but not from everybody because not every child gave us a urine sample. And at age seven, we gave them the Wexler scale for intelligence for children 
the whisk. I think there's probably a version in Brazil as well. We gave them actually the Bailey at age three, and in a previous publication, we found similar results to what I'll show you today. We also at age seven gave them a behavior scale, the Connors behavior, parent behavior rating scale, as well as the CBCL, the child behavior te uh, checklist. Those are administered to mothers, their mother's report. And I'll even show you data out to age 11 today on motor function. So what is the WISC measure? It measures four components of what we usually call IQ or general intelligence. It measures verbal comprehension. It measures perceptual reasoning, which is a logic measure. It measures working memory. And it measures processing speed, how fast do you get information and sort of process it. In all of our models, I'm showing this now so I don't have to re keep on repeating myself, we actually have a very rich data set. So in the models I'll be showing you, we've either checked or controlled for these variables. For the home scale, which is a measure of the quality of the child-rearing environment. And in this study, the interviewers actually went to the homes and you do sort of a, a look around while you're chatting with the mother using a structured sort of interview. And you see if there's books in the house, if there are toys around, how the mother and child interact, right? So if the mother spanks the child or screams at the child or is loving towards the child, um, as well as the quality of the building structure itself. Race, ethnicity, maternal IQ, um, which was measured because some of our, our population is not um, extremely literate. We use a nonverbal measure of maternal IQ called the TONY. Uh, maternal hardship and satisfaction, so those are measured using s um, scales that ask the mother if she experiences money difficulties in paying rent, in buying food, in having medical care, in buying clothing, and how satisfied she is with her life whether or not the child was breastfed and for how long, the birth weight, the child sex, maternal demoralization, which is really a m not quite satisfaction, but sort of whether or not the mother feels um, down and feels that she can't improve her circumstances. Um, marital status, because many of our mothers are single mothers, in fact most of them are. Maternal education, household income, how many other children in the house, the gestational age, the three-year uh, Bailey measure that we gave, as well as this study has been very productive in use looking at a wide range of other exposures like um, tobacco smoke, environmental tobacco smoke, so tobacco smoke from other people around the child, not the mothers, alcohol, uh, pesticides, l uh, environmental lead, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are products of combustion, and BPA. So we've either controlled or tried to control for all of those variables. So this is sort of what the population looks like. They live, these blue dots show exactly where they live in relationship to New York City. And what this, this shows here is the proportion of people in the city living below the federal poverty line. So the darker ones indicate more people under the federal poverty line, and that's exactly where our population lives. Th these are relatively poor women. They're, as I said, they're African American and mainly immigrants from Dominica. They live in northern Manhattan and the South Bronx. Um, they, they have a rather low IQ of 85 compared to the normal, which is around 100. They're about one standard deviation under the mean. They're 67% um, have never been married. 36%, um, but they're still pretty educated because only 36% have less than a high school education, which in the U.S. is 12 years. Um, about half the children were girls, and at the age seven visit, the children were just age seven. We, we measured phthalates in the maternal urine in the third trimester, and then we went and compared our values to the NHANES study, 
where there were 91 pregnant women across the U.S. to see how our, country, our women were doing in relationship to a sample of women across the U.S. And as you could see, we actually have slightly lower concentrations of this particular metabolite. This one wasn't measured in NHANES, but we have higher concentrations of these two metabolites. Remember that because they become very important, MNBP and MIBP, and slightly lower of MEP. Um, because we, we were only measuring phthalates once, we were very worried about do they really reflect concentrations during pregnancy. We happened to have in 130, in 48 women, we had multiple samples of urine over a six week period. And we actually looked at the interclass correlation coefficients to look at whether or not the concentrations we were using were truly reflective. And they're, they're not so good. Reflecting, maybe the moms are not consistent in their product use. They are, you know, around 0 0.6, 0 0.7, for MNBP, MIBP, and MVZP, and that's, that's okay, it's not fabulous, but for the others, they're not so good. So you have to remember that, and that's one limitation in the results, that we only had one measure and doesn't reflect exposure during the course of pregnancy. So I'll just tell you what we didn't find first, the null findings, is that MEP or DEHP metabolites and any of the measures at age seven. Those were totally null. We didn't find anything with MBZP and H7 outcomes except for a marginal association with one of the with subscales. So these are the ones that were least reliable, by the way. So we're talking about the more reliable ones when I do describe the findings. We did the reliability study way before we looked at this, so no cheating. All right? <laughs> so we used... Um, just straight um, multiple regression for these analyses and controlling for those variables that I described below, they're also listed on the bottom. And we found resounding results uh, between each log unit increase in these metabolites. They're not normally distributed, so we transform them. And perceptual reasoning, processing speed, working memory, and verbal concentration for as well as total IQ. And this is nice to see the regression coefficients. It's even nicer to see that some of the associations, particularly for MNBP and full-scale IQ, were present in girls, but not really that much in boys. Okay? And that the association for MIBP was about the same in girls and boys, and you could look at both the point estimates as well as those confidence intervals. But this shows it a little bit better because if what we did here was take each phthalate metabolite and we broke it up into four groups from the lowest to the highest and just broke it up into quartiles and used that as the exposure variable in the regression models. And you could see that if you look at, this is represents the IQ score. And this is full scale IQ. And it's from the lowest exposure to the highest exposure of this particular metabolite, there was about a 6.6 .6 point decrease, full scale IQ, that's very large actually. The standard deviation of IQ is 15 points. Um, for MBZP, not so much, but for the metabolite of DIBP, there was almost an eight point decrease there and they look pretty linear in these um, models and we did check the linearity. And you could see that it was the same was true for most of the subscales of IQ. So this is perceptual reasoning, working memory, verbal comprehension, and processing speed. These are adjusted graphs for all of these. And you could see with some exceptions, mainly for MBZP, um, here, here, and here, MBZP was only associated with perceptual reasoning, as I showed you. The others show this very nice sort of linear relationship with decline in many IQ type domains. So we were pretty sure of these findings. Um, we were pretty sure that there might be some uh, difference between boys and girls. Um, so this is sort of one set of cognition findings 
Again, I'll, I'll stress that these products are found in food packaging. They're also found in personal care products. So moving on to the behavior scales, also measured at age seven, the results I'm going to show you are from the Connors Parent Rating Scale, which looks at these kinds of behavioral problems in children that are reported by the mother during a sort of an interview. Oppositional, cognition, hyperactivity, anxious, shy, perfectionism, social problems, and sort of psychosomatic, and then an index of um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And I, I think we, we, sh we won't go into those. But I, we focused on this because this scale has been used as mainly an ADHD scale, primarily, as well as some of the um, other previous literature had on phthalates had suggested that boys may exhibit less masculine and more feminine behavior from sort of early type exposures. So this was a good scale to use because there's some what we would generally call feminine behaviors on this scale like anxious, shy, perfectionism, and social problems. They're considered to be more feminine type behaviors. So just in summary, um, this is for all of the children together. For MBZP, one of the metabolites, we found an increase in oppositional and anxious, shy behaviors associated with that. For another metabolite, we found an increase in um, uh, psychosomatic behaviors. And for one phthalate, we actually found a decreased association with hyperactivity that might reflect the more feminizing effect of some of these phthalates because mainly people, this is sort of hyperactivity and impulsive, it's not the intention type deficit disorder. It's really the, the one that's found more in boys. We did find, um, it's a hard slide, in pink are the results for girls and in green are the results for boys. We found some modification by child sex. And in particular, if you focus on the green, for these sort of psychosomatic and anxious shy behaviors, we found more associations for boys or stronger association for boys than we did for girls, okay? And for the social problems, we also found a stronger association for boys and no association for girls. So, you know, so these were in line with some of the other literature that had been published but hadn't gone out to age seven. So, and this one I'm going to skip actually, and this one I'm going to skip. So if we wanted to look at sort of a summary of the results for the behavior problem work, we do find um, the black arrows show are for more attention, right? So in the whole cohort in girls and in boys. So we found more problems for anxious shy in boys and more sort of psychosomatic problems in girls. However, we did find this decline in um, cognitive problems or inattentive behaviors or this hyperactivity impulsive behavior. So more, more in line with that. And we're, we're just submitting these results now for publication. So now going out to age 11. At age 11, at, at another follow-up visit, we administered a very standard test of motor ability called the Brunings Osireski test, and it has both the composite measure of motor ability as well as a fine motor scale and a gross motor scale. So some of the tasks for the gross motor scale, for example, are having the child walk on a balance beam, having the child jump, having the child throw a ball, and some of the fine motor ones are having the, door, the child copy, copy figures um, or, or um, touching their, their nose with their eyes closed, things tasks like that. And just very briefly, I'll show you um, the um, results from that. And so again, for these same three phthalate metabolites, this is a pattern now, we, we find decrements in the highest exposed groups and both in the, t in the total points as well as in the fine motor and in the gross motor as well. And these results didn't differ in boys and girls. So there's something actually going on 
also with sort of motor function in relationship to exposure to these phthalates. So one thing we've been interested in is whether or not one possible mechanism for these associations is through declines in thyroid function in the children. So exposure to phthalates has been, is an endocrine disruptor. It's probably associated with decreased prenatal testosterone in the mother or uh, sort of an inhibition of the fetus to get adequate testosterone to go to the brain because testosterone is important for brain development. Unfortunately, we didn't have the samples to measure that. We did have, however, blood samples in the children at age three and at age five and at age seven to look at whether or not concurrent phthalate association, remember I showed you we, that we measured phthalates in the child and we did find some associations with cognition but nothing as strong as for the maternal prenatal concentrations. Um, but we did look at the concurrent associations relating phthalates to free T4, three free thyroxine in the children to see if there was an association. And we found this association to be sex specific for girls only. And again, sort of the same, almost the same group of phthalates with a few exceptions seem to be inhibited, um, seems to inhibit the production of free T4, but not of TSH, which is an interesting finding because what it says is that exposure to these phthalates might directly affect production of T4 by the thyroid, and it's not part of that HPT axis, the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. So th that's one potential mechanism. And it could be because phthalates actually are what, what's called NIS symporter um, agents. So they, they actually inhibit iodine to go into the thyroid hormone and they replace iodine in the thyroid hormone. And that seems to be the mechanism that we're sort of our working hypothesis is, and this is still a work in progress. So in conclusion, I mean, I think that I've hopefully have convinced you that thyroid exposure is ubiquitous in adults, in children. It's highly likely that exposure from personal care products can be from multiple routes of exposure, dermal inhalation and ingestion, and also exposure from, from food products as well. Um, exposure in mothers and children appear to be correlated, likely due to the similarity of product use and, other, and diet. That exposure in children could be a little bit more variable because of changes in product use over time as the children grow older. It's possible that a simple count of product use in the last 24 hours is a good surrogate for the phthalate biomarkers, so a cheap surrogate actually. And that importantly, there appears to be persistent and concurrent associations between phthalate metabolite measures and outcomes in children, including cognition, behavior, and motor function. I didn't show you the concurrent associations, but they're reduced in magnitude, they're smaller. So it really seems to be the prenatal exposure, or we think it's the prenatal exposure and that one possible mechanism may be with interference with the production of thyroid hormone. That should be, that's a typo, I'm sorry. And so this is the work of a lot of people. It's the work of this group from the Children's Center, as well as uh, Antonia Califat, who measures everything at the CDC for us, um, our study participants, the funders, which is NIEHS, National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, part of NIH, and the Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you, uh, Pam. Very comprehensive and very interesting presentation. And we can see it has uh, very important uh, public implications. I wonder why Brazil took so long to start uh, regulating it. And the U.S. took that long also. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so um, we, we have time for some questions. Any? 
Yes, and when that. It's just to thank you again for, for the nice presentation. I wonder if you have data to look into this behavior of the boys uh, having more anxiety and shyness when they reach puberty. Um, if this would be so that's a great question because yeah. we've just funded to follow these children now at age 18. Yeah. So these children are getting older and we still have a pretty stable cohort of about 300 children that we're following and yes. So there's other studies going on, not just the phthalate work. So one of my colleagues, um, Ginny um, Rao, has looked at MRIs of the brain in relationship to environmental tobacco smoke exposure during pregnancy as well as to one of the pesticides during pregnancy. And so she'll be repeating those MRIs at age 18. We're planning, if we get funding, to do the phthalates and the brain function on the MRIs that she so graciously paid for. Um, but the analysis is very difficult, actually, to look at the MRI and specific uh, anatomical and functional aspects of brain function um, because it has to be done separately. The MRIs are evaluated separately in relationship to each compound. So um, the answer is yes, because the children are still receiving neuropsychological batteries, so we'll be able to take advantage of those data. Yeah, that will be interesting to see whether it could, it could be something temporary for this kind of behavior, like, uh, you know, feeling. But this is yeah. at age seven. Yes. Oh, no, what I'm saying, like, how, how is going the magnitude of right. the effect if you would enlarge or not? So if you, if you go back to some of the literature in environmental lead, so we stopped our study in Yugoslavia when the children were age 12 because at that point there was a war and we couldn't really, and people scattered. So we couldn't reconstruct the cohort after the war. Um, but some of the other studies of environmental lead, notably the one in um, uh, Massachusetts done by Herb Needleman and David Bellinger, they actually followed the, the children out to early adulthood and found increases in antisocial behavior yeah. in relationship to environmental lead exposure during pregnancy as well as um, um, in decreases in educational attainment. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's, uh, you said that it's quite hard, it's expensive, and so uh, to measure, you know, exposure to this type of compounds, and you are using kind of uh, urine would measure a short-term mm -hmm. exposure. Uh, is there any possibility, um, a gold standard method, non-invasive, to have to look into long-term exposure, whether this is, is stored in fat or? So they're not stored. In okay. fact, they're rapidly metabolized. Okay. And that seems to be the issue in measurement. So there's, you can't measure them in blood. You have to be extraordinarily careful to measure them because we use phthalate-free equipment when we collect the samples. Oh, all right. As well as... Um, yeah, you have them. So I'm measuring them in a, st in a birth cohort that we're currently um, establishing in Israel. And we actually use phthalate we actually get the urine samples before anything's done to the mother, before blood is taken, before anything, because we're afraid of contamination from exposure from the what's used to do it. So they're very tricky to collect the samples, and they're tricky to measure because, again, the equipment has to be phthalate-free. They're usually, the concentrations are not incredibly high, so the limit of detection has to be very low and you can't have contamination. Um, additionally, the labs are variable. So there's a, the lab we're establishing in Israel just did its first round of quality control with the European group and did fine on two metabolites and miserably on the rest. So they're still working on them. <laughs> so the, the, the actual measurement method is, not, is difficult. Some people have tried to measure in breast milk. Pessoal, se vocês tiverem eh, perguntas, a gente pode traduzir. Se vocês tiverem vergonha de falar inglês. I'm saying if they want to ask in Portuguese, we can just translate. I hope you enjoy at least understood some of what is taught here. 
And um, I think there, there, there are some interesting points. Uh, this is mostly an audience of uh, dietitians, nutritionists. So we, we are already very concerned with what we eat. And now we also need to be concerned how is packaged the food, right? Uh, Life is absolutely getting very tough. And I, I wanted to ask you something about uh, the me methodological uh, aspect of mm -hmm. this project, uh, this analysis, and the topic itself. In it, it's quite related to what Amanda said because this is quite expensive to measure. And um, perhaps you could speak a little bit more about the surrogates you use in terms of the number of projects in terms of contact because if it costs like two hundred dollars right. to measure a sample how good is the surrogates so you know nobody's done really analyses using the surrogate i did it just because i didn't have the urine data yet and i only had actually the questionnaire data on the first 40 kids in israel now we have more and i'm going to repeat it a and we still haven't don't have the money actually to send the urines out for analysis. Um, so we're going to look to see whether or not just the product counts. And we did it, I should say in Israel, I didn't bring the slides with me. We did it for personal care products and for food packaging, as well as for um, cleaning products like detergents and things like that. And we found the same pattern of association with this reduced penile width in the boys. So it, it looks like promising, but it's not set in stone yet. I wouldn't use it in a major study yet until I had at least some of the urines back and I can look to see if there's a correlation between the product use and the um, urine concentrations. And so Sheila did that in that University of Washington study and she found a very nice relationship with it, but I still would want it validated in every population, at least on a sample with the urinary metabolites in the products. So this, I this is a um, very good example of life course epidemiology, how you measure things uh, during pregnancy and follow up uh, up to 7, 11, 18 years. We don't have um, so many studies that been following people in Brazil, uh, few bird cohorts like Pelotas, Ribeirão Preto, we have a small cohort. Uh, we we were unable to follow up to two years, but this is the idea. And if you like the seminar tomorrow, uh, Pam is gonna give a, a, a course of three hours, not about uh, phthalates, but life course epidemiology, which is a bit uh, broader with more nutrition involved in epidemiology, and we still have some places left. So just email or Jacqueline if you want a place. So thank you very much for your attention and patience, and thanks much, Pam. Thank you.